Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and uh, to get started, I'm just going to ask uh, folks up here to, to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the sort of uh, key things that they're pursuing in their roles at their respective companies. So, Xander, can you, uh, can you jump in and start? Sure. <clears throat> nice to be here. My name is Xander Lurie. I'm a Senior Vice President of Strategic Development at the CBS Corporation. I uh, was the CFO of CNET Networks. CBS acquired our company back in May of 2008. And I moved into this role uh, a couple years ago. I helped the CEO and CFO on strategic initiatives across all of our interactive platforms. So, as you know, CBS and Showtime produce a lot of television content. Uh, we're now distributing these in a multi platform world, I'm looking at uh, new distribution partners, new business models, how that touches advertising, retrans, subscriptions, as well as MA, other investment opportunities to help grow the big media company that we are today. Jimmy? Hi, I'm Jimmy Pitaro, and I uh, share responsibility for the Disney Interactive Media Group. Uh, we have two divisions within Disney Interactive. We have the game side, which is uh, made up of our virtual worlds like Club Penguin and our console, uh, social, and mobile games. And on, on, the, on the online side, we have all of our websites like Disney.com and Family.com. Uh, we recently also acquired a company called Babbel out of New York, which will join our mom's portfolio of sites. I've been at the company for a little over a year. I'm uh, Ben Silverman, uh, exec producer of television, and uh, new company Electus is uh, making a lot of content for digital platforms. I've worked with Jimmy in a previous incarnation at Yahoo, where we're making a lot of content, and as well are um, building three YouTube channels right now in partnership with Google and uh, are focused uh, a great deal on developing new markets for our content, not just secondary uh, markets, but also trying to build first-run relationships with new platforms and uh, all video-driven. Great. So, Will, all, all three of you guys are leading initiatives uh, in the digital space. Let's talk about the YouTube channels and YouTube in general. Ben and, uh, and Jimmy, you guys are coming at it uh, both uh, with a real commitment to YouTube, but in very different ways. First, whose way is better? Who's smarter between the two of you? Uh, and um, I disagree, neither. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'll trade a lot I, I, even up for Disney. I choose. Yeah, Xander. <laughs> Xander. I'll represent he didn't do the deal. Exactly. Uh, who's right? Who's wrong? Are you both right? And describe the difference between the two. And then, Xander, be curious to hear as an outsider you know, what you guys think of, uh, at CBS of uh, all this noise at YouTube. Um, so uh, we closed a deal with YouTube a few months ago, and the idea uh, behind the deal was to create uh, the, the premier uh, family experience, family video experience online. And uh, essentially, at a very high level, the deal has two components. We will be creating Disney on YouTube, um, and then we, we will also be taking the YouTube brand and bringing it on to Disney.com. So a full ecosystem of video that kind of cross-promotes. Uh, in terms of the content that will live within both channels, um, again, Disney on YouTube and YouTube on Disney, several, several different categories. The first is um, curation. So we'll be curating um, the content that's currently on YouTube that we think is very Disney-relevant and family-friendly and pulling it into the, the Disney experience on YouTube. Um, also, we're going to be partnering, um, as has been, um, we're going to be partnering with YouTube to create um, original digital program, excuse me, programming that will live within uh, the experience. Uh, we also, within Disney Interactive, have a team called Dolo Disney Online Originals that creates a lot of um, original content uh, for the space, and that content will all live within these two channels. So several different categories. Um, again, the, the idea here is um, to create an experience where uh, kids can be really psyched because the brand is very relevant. Today, at least my kids, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, and my kids actually think that YouTube is video. They, many of them, many kids from my experience don't know that they can even access video anywhere else. I think today YouTube has something like four billion streams a day, um, 800 million unique users per month. Um, so for us, it was an opportunity to, I guess, be more open and go to where our, our users are. So. We're in the process right now of rebuilding Disney.com, and that's great. We're really excited about this new product. It'll launch sometime um, this spring. But we also want to be open, meaning we want to bring um, Disney.com and all the Disney content and experiences 
to where our users are. In other words, not just ask them to come to Disney.com, but to take Disney.com to where they are. And obviously, that's on YouTube. So we're pretty excited about it. Um, phase one, which is the Disney on YouTube experience, will launch end of February. And then the, uh, the YouTube on Disney experience will launch sometime uh, this spring. So that's, that's the Disney YouTube deal. So that seems different, Ben, from uh, all you're accomplishing. Uh, maybe you can lay it out. Yeah, I mean, a p part of it, obviously, is uh, Jimmy has this fantastic existing infrastructure and ecosystem of, of Disney. So that kind of cross-promotion uh, partnership was not a route that we would immediately go in as a first-run content maker. But what we are really excited about is, you know, trying to develop channels for the future through new distribution mechanisms. And one of the things that I think is really unique and cool about YouTube right now as it expands is what's also going on with Android and what we're seeing in the video consumption across other devices, obviously smartphone, uh, iPad, and uh, clearly not Android, but still plugging into those devices. And so our goal really is approaching it as how do we develop the channels of the future? Is this an opportunity to look at Google the way you would have looked at cable television 25 years ago? And maybe it's generational. To your point, it, you know, younger people seem to be over-indexing in the consumption. Um, and we're making that bet from a resource investment. But what I'm particularly excited about is this is the first time I've seen in my um, career a major technology company and um, non-traditional television platform actually make a real investment. On relative dollars, it's much smaller than the investment CBS, ABC, NBC make in content, but it's a great sign of what's going to differentiate all these different platforms is going to be killer content. And I think that, that piece of it is what I believe is most exciting for us and probably yep. exciting for you is potentially, and the way they're structuring the deals are much more partnership forward than the current deal models we get in other um, distribution platforms. That might be because they don't yet have the infrastructure to give you a lot of notes and to, to drive down creative filters, but it's also amazingly liberating. And I think one of the things that everyone um, is excited about is the fact that you can have a little more creative autonomy than currently exists in the more uh, broadcasting cable universe. And we're, we're going after the Hispanic market with Sofia Vergara and Luis Balagua, who are, are um, friends and partners on Nuevan, which is one of our channels. And we're doing a pop culture channel called Loud. And uh, we have a, a deal with the people who ran MTV and created everything from uh, TRL to Jersey Shore to The Hills, uh, Tony DeSanto and Liz Gately. And we're looking for programming and to build loud in that manner, uh, MTV without the music. Oh wait, MTV doesn't have music, so that works. <laughs> and, then, um, and then we're also going after the food space, which we believe is incredibly rich, and we're doing a lot of work with your um, agency uh, in that space. And part of what excites us about food is the promise of what YouTube does and going after those niches, chocolate lovers, cheese lovers, you know, going into gluten-free, the things that maybe won't warrant a huge enough audience for a linear cable television or broadcast audience, but have passion plays and could potentially grow into something bigger. So Xander, I'm going to ask you the question that yep. ben, ben won't want me to ask openly, but he will uh, covertly. <laughs> Are you going to, this guy has, has been an entrepreneur before, he's an entrepreneur right now, he's creating value and taking risk on YouTube. So are you going to step in in five years and buy all these channels? Um, you know, in a, in, a, in a marketplace where cable television uh, is so expensive, it's so expensive to start a, a channel, it's so expensive yeah. to buy one, do you guys look at this as an M&A opportunity down the road? I hear your question, and I'm going to answer another. I think, <laughs> yeah. I, I think Ben's right that this is kind of the, you know, what YouTube's created is kind of a, the cable industry for, you know, this 21st century, and it enables gluten-free lovers to have a channel. <laughs> and, you know, Robert Kinsel, who kind of architected the strategy and is getting better looking with the size of his checkbook, has put a pretty cool <laughs> strategy in place to get a lot of storytellers to come forward to create channels, and Ben's right, you know, when you give the, the entrepreneur uh, the ability to own that IP, you know, they're going to be pretty aggressive at creating 
these channels. You know, as he said, you know, the, the level of investment today, you know, a $5 million channel, you know, there, there are pilots that will spend three or four times that amount on. So it doesn't quite raise the level of big broadcast, big tent, 25 million kind of viewer kinds of video content, but we're obviously watching it closely. YouTube is a huge um, refer of traffic to CBS.com and our other video properties, just like Facebook, just like Twitter. Um, so we do have a good partnership with YouTube. I wouldn't say we've been as aggressive on this kind of niche channel strategy, but if it does kind of this fledgling space grow into the, you know, a, a niche-oriented cable channel with millions and millions of viewers, then it's going to require all the big media companies pay closer attention. And yes, it could emerge into one where we're buying channels not dissimilar from, you know, the niche cable channels that were acquired over the last 15 years. Well, Ben and I are going to root for that, so we're, we, we hope that's where it goes. So um, let's sort of switch topics a little bit. So when you're creating content, whether online or for television, social media is a key component of that. Xander, you, you control quite a significant network, and you're doing a lot online. Maybe you can start us off. Uh, how, do you, how are you intersecting with Facebook, Twitter, and other key platforms? Yeah. I'll tell you, I mean, we, Leslie Moonves has said this a number of times, we're kind of living in the golden age of television right now. Um, partly it's because we have 20 of the top 30 shows on television, and his team has done a great job. But there's no doubt that you can attribute some of the credit to the strength of Facebook and Twitter and the social media platform. So it starts first, you know, the content first uh, saying still holds true. It starts obviously with the storytelling. We're competing for consumers' time and attention. And if you don't have a great story with compelling characters that make you laugh or make you cry, you're not going to get the consumer's time and attention um, or, the advertiser's, um, or the advertiser's money. But what we're seeing is that the social media platforms are driving so much audience back to CBS to engage with the content. And it requires the showrunners and producers and our chief marketing officers team to be really creative. So you know, today we have well over 100 million likes across all of our shows on Facebook. You're seeing the stars on our shows, whether it's Ashton Kutcher on Two and a Half Men or Mark Harmon on NCIS. You're seeing how effectively their Twitter followers can drive people back to the shows. And you're actually seeing stars today actually have influence in who you're picking to star in these shows. They bring together an installed base of audience. Um, and when you, what happens is not only are the fans able to engage on CBS.com and tweet about the show, I don't know what else you could attribute double-digit increases in the NFL and in the Grammys to than social media. I mean, Tim fantasy Tebow, football. fantasy football is another great example, which is social, right? It's, it's totally social. It's you and me competing on a week-to-week -week basis and having a reason to tune back in and watch the game. So um, we're convinced that when you enable fans to talk to each other, to add more content, that these shows go from being 24-minute episodes or 42-minute episodes to brands that have a living, breathing, all week kind of opportunity to engage with their audience on iPads and phones and on the web. And I, I think today that social media can either help your brand or hurt your brand. You know, it used to be the day when you launch a bad movie and you jam the audience with advertising on Thursday, it has a pretty good weekend and nobody ever goes to see it again. You know, today Twitter will euthanize your movie if it sucks on Thursday night. So social media is your friend if you've got great content and it can bring people to it, engages uh, fans to come back to the content. If, it, if the content's not good, it, it won't only help you, it will hurt you. Jimmy, at, uh, at Disney you have a different issue with social media, which is it's hard to utilize all the different aspects of social media around families and kids and children. Yeah. So I've got to imagine you have a, another layer of challenges you have to solve. How are you guys addressing that? We, we do. Um, we, we acquired a company called Digicin several years ago, um, which has been uh, incorporated, integrated into Disney Interactive, and they are essentially the social media arm for the Walt Disney Company, and their, their job is to socialize all of our content, all of our characters, all of our stories across Facebook, and today um, we, have, we have about 250 million fans of Disney on Facebook across about 250 pages, and that's great. Um, we take a lot of pride in those numbers, but at the same time, we need to do a better job at driving real direct value um, from all of those fans and all of those likes. Uh, and so some of the things that we're looking at right now include, um, number one, possibly linking back from Facebook to, um, to our owned and operated sites. So, you know, we have all this content um, on all of these Disney pages, but it's very rare that we actually provide links back to Disney.com or DisneyFamily.com. 
And so we're starting to um, entertain those types of discussions internally. Now, that, there's risk there, right? If you start driving people off of Facebook, out of the network, and um, they actually may not even realize that by clicking on a link, they will be leaving the Facebook network. There's danger there because they could get frustrated then and come back and unlike you. Um, and then, then you have a big problem, right? Because then, to Xander's point, then you're actually doing harm to your brand. So you have to tread very lightly in this space. So we're just starting to kind of dip our feet in the water on this topic. And then another thing that we're starting to consider right now is, is direct monetization, right? Um, so we have um, all this engagement on Facebook right now around our brand and our content, um, but yet we're not directly monetizing it. Now, we're still driving value, right? Um, because you're driving engagement around your, your, your programming, your films, your characters, and that's, that's all positive. But is there, is there an opportunity to directly monetize and to, and, and to partner? And do you look at social media as a way to reach kids or a way to reach parents? Well, I mean, Facebook is over 13, right? right? So we, we're not, we're not going to go after, um, unless Facebook does something in the kids' space, we're not going to go after children on Facebook. We're going to go after the over 13 audience. But, you know, the Walt Disney Company, is, you know, is focused on family-friendly experiences. So, so likewise, when we're on Facebook, we're going after family, the, the, the family experience as opposed to, to, the ki to the kid experience. But I'd say, you know, the, one of the really interesting spaces right now is um, th this idea of creating these social experiences around content, right? And so you have, you know, all the usual suspects like Get Glue and, and mis mis misu, um, uh, Miso, uh, I'm not sure I'm Close pronouncing it right. Close, Close enough. enough. Um, uh, at Yahoo made an acquisition, I think it's called Into Now. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the, the, the idea there is to create these contextually relevant experiences around what's happening on the television screen, whether it's through um, audio fingerprinting or, or, what, or whatever. But um, that's an interesting space. We've actually done a lot in that regard. We've, we've created several apps that actually recognize what's happening on the screen, whether it's a, a Bambi DVD or an ABC television program. Again, through this audio fingerprinting technology, um, using the microphone on the device and recognizing what's on the screen and then creating this contextually relevant experience around the content, that's an interesting space that we're starting to investigate and pursue a little bit more seriously. I think the big question there is, um, in terms of the second screen experience, when, when people are actually on their second screen and they're, they're watching a television show or they're watching a DVD, um, do they actually want an experience on their second screen that is relevant, or do they want to get through email and do something a little bit different where they're kind of multitasking? I know my wife and I, when we're on our couch, we're actually doing something that's not related. So the question is, how much? Shh, you, don't want, you don't want to talk about that. Yeah. Right, right, that's right, 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 exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the question is, how much of an investment do you really want to make in that space, this contextually relevant second screen experience, um, if, if at the end of the day people truly do want the second screen experience, but they, they, they don't want it really to be directly relevant to what's on the screen, they want to be doing something else. Right. So, so Ben, some very smart words from these guys who are innovating. You have a a test and an opportunity coming up with Fashion Star, which is you know, a remarkable opportunity for Electus and for you. You've spent a lot of time putting it together, and I'm sure you know, there's tons of options in and around social media. I assume it's a big part of it. Can you explain and yeah. talk about where you're choosing to spend your time? Well, a absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things uh, that Jimmy raises is one of the things that we still haven't figured out how to do yet either, which is that direct monetization, other than uh, potentially working with an ad partner who's willing to fund an, a little additional incremental around the association within Facebook, but Facebook is the one who's really monetizing everything we're doing, or Twitter's monetizing it. We're using it more as now an extended circular marketing tool and a deeper way for our show fans to enjoy the projects 24-7, not just their appointed time in one hour. Um, and in Fashion Star, we literally built out a whole digital production budget. And in the casting and hiring of people like Jessica Simpson and Nicole Ritchie, we were very conscious of the power they have in social media and also the power they have in conversation in terms of sparking it and creating it. And um, additionally, we brought in a full-time digital correspondent, Jeannie Mai, from uh, the Style Network, who we actually have shot in parallel tons of content that will live not only on a fashion star page that'll live within NBC.com, but also will live across the social uh, graph. 
And we've also um, spent a ton of time having every single one of our contestants set up uh, pages that we control with them. Um, we also ensure that they bank all their tweets because we pre-tape the show and they bank all their updates in that moment so it's still fresh and real and relates to it instead of them looking back at it and forcing it. So everything that will be unleashed as the episodes start to roll out is stuff, most of it, that they banked and tweeted uh, for us and then will be launched as show uh, starts running. And uh, it absolutely is a huge component as we think about launching a show because there's a real sense that if you can create social momentum around a project, that you get a rating correlation. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a period in time where we thought that's our competition, meaning the, uh, the media platform. And now, to Xander's point, I think we see it as this complementary and potentially reinforcing what's happening in the mothership to those double-digit growth. And the team that did The Voice at NBC, which had a huge amount of investment in that, um, opened, I think, their eyes to the power of it. And so they, in turn, on this show, made a similar investment in what we would do digitally and socially. And your, your advertisers and your partners on the show, I assume, were demanding a certain level of, of social media activation. So how much, of, how much of what you're doing is responding not only to the desire to build a show, but also to make sure you're, you're a great partner to your advertisers? Um, absolutely, the brands are further ahead, in, in my opinion, than... Um, the media companies in how they are directly monetizing and building off of the social media graph because they don't ever view any of this as competition. They, they want it all to be, in, you know, they'd love a show that could air on ABC, CBS, and NBC, but obviously those three networks don't want to do that. So the, um, you know, so they are actually a great partner in keeping the IP pure and pushing out their own parallel strategies to draw attention to their association with the show. And you see a real robust offering. Nothing compared to the 250 million number, you know, and most of those numbers are in the one to three million and that's, that's a success. And then you start, there's the occasional Starbucks or somebody who, who dwarfs that, but um, there's real opportunity to enlist them in partnership and react to their needs for more content, content for their websites, content for their social platforms, exclusive tweets, you know, a lot that you never thought about five years ago. That's a, that's a remarkable appetite for uh, how much you have to deliver now. Yeah, us. exactly. You're doing 3x the work for the... Ben's the got a, he's got a unique perspective on this. I mean, if you think about the traditional media business that we're in, it's create great content, use social media to drive as many people back to it, and we can monetize that audience with advertising. What we're talking about now in social media, and obviously Ben did this, and I think The Biggest Loser is the, the best example of it, is you're creating content that is almost built to be a vehicle to monetize stuff other than just pure ads. And so whether it's Starbucks or a media company, you want to get your message out there, you want to get that brand um, to be loved by consumers, and there's no better way to do that than using storytelling as the missile and from that, you know, you saw Who Do You Think You Are did a good job of this. Biggest Loser is the best with the weight loss subscriptions and shakes. And use the storytelling to create a brand that can be monetized across multiple venues. And so I think what we're seeing today is first use social media to create more audience and heat around the product. And it's got to be a great story. And if you do that well, then you can monetize it a million. I mean, think about what Angry Birds is going to do over the next 10 years in terms yeah. of multi-platform. Unique content in any form wins which makes, you know, an exciting moment for entrepreneurs, which, which leads to where does it all go? And so that's where I want to, you know, talk to you guys specifically. Jimmy, you just acquired um, Babel. Xander, you've been, you've been building out uh, the digital media assets at CBS. So where does it go for big media companies, both in what you're, you're, what you're building with, Walt, with the Walt Disney Company and Xander at the CBS Corporation? How do you look at, you know, production company multiples, which are six to ten on acquisition, versus the you know, much greater multiples in and around digital media companies and distributors? Look, I mean, I, I've kind of played in both the Silicon Valley world and now in the more traditional media world. Um, there's a huge long runway for traditional media companies to continue to monetize this content. So 
uh, Armando Nunez is here at the, at the conference. He leads our international distribution business. When you look at the growth in the international distribution of television content, obviously Ben's group has successfully um, realized value here too. You know, the United States is doing two things really, really well these days. The export of television content and the export of internet services. And those two combined are driving a lot of growth for entertainment companies. So you're going to see the monetization of our content internationally for years to come. And then you have this whole over-the-top market. You know, Netflix and Amazon are the leaders today, but Google and Apple are obviously being very aggressive. Then you got all the set-top box manufacturers, um, the Samsungs and LGs and others who are looking to find ways to get used content to help drive device sales. So that's going to be a big leader for the content business. And then you start to talk about these new content formats on YouTube and others. So I think the, we think the, the business model and environment for storytellers right now is as good as it's ever been. Jimmy, how does, uh, how does uh, the Walt Disney Company think about acquisitions in the digital space these days? So um, I'll, I'll focus on, on Babel because that's most recent. We, the Babel discussion was, for me, pretty easy. Um, because we're, we're a storytelling company, and um, you know, our responsibility at Disney Interactive is to expand on that. So we actually, um, we, we formed, over the past year, we formed a separate team, as I mentioned before, called Disney Online Originals. And um, for the first time now, we're actually starting to um, create our own IP which is, which is somewhat daunting at a company like the Walt Disney Company. There are very high um, standards. And so um, we are now um, starting to invest in original IP. We've actually had a lot of success with a recent game um, called Where's My Water, um, which is, was number one um, in the iTunes store uh, for quite some time. It's been top ten, I think, since its launch over the past several months. Um, but the, the great thing about Where's My Water is that it is original IP. It introduces an original character, Swampy. And so the idea here is whether it's through a game or through um, original video series, for our group to start creating IP that could maybe someday um, turn into a television show or turn into a theme park ride or be leveraged by the consumer products division. Um, so we're now starting to, to, to make those kinds of investments. And then if you fast forward to the Babel acquisition, I mean, Babbel is essentially a storytelling company. I mean, it's a network of the top mom bloggers or parent bloggers um, in the world. And we felt that they were actually telling great stories about parenting. It felt very consistent um, with everything we were trying to do within our moms and family um, portfolio of sites. So it fit in very well. And, um, you know, we look closely at the team. I'd say in terms of acquisition in my space, um, it's, we're very focused on engineering talent. I mean, it's very, very competitive in, in Los Angeles to, to recruit um, talented um, engineers, talented tech. Um, so that's a big focus of ours as we look at, at potential acquisition. And then, of course, the balance sheet. I mean, we want, we want whatever we acquire to be accretive to our P&L. You know, our, our business unit is on a march to profitability, so we want to make sure that what we acquire um, is not just um, uh, profitable long-term, but can help us also in the short term. And we thought that Babel kind of fit um, all of those elements. So. So, uh, so staying online and talking about the creation of original content, Xander, you've done a ton uh, with Netflix and others. And Ben, you, you sort of started this craze way back when with MSN. You know, how much is original content, both in single episodic series, whether it's with Yahoo or MSN or Netflix and House of Cards, how much will it matter to your businesses today and going forward? Um, and, and how much time are you focusing on creating original content for the internet? Well, I, clearly, as Xander referenced, the, the traditional model is, is growing and the advertising increases keep happening year on year and the new networks that emerge and now want to define themselves, specifically cable, through original programming for you know, an LA-based uh, storytelling factory AMC didn't exist five years ago, you know, from an original content perspective. And you're seeing that across the board. Um, and so around the first one for internet and looking at over-the-top opportunities and Netflix-type um, distribution, we want to be there because 
the hope is that they will grow and expand just as the cable networks did in terms of their investment threshold and differentiation via content. I think the most, I don't know how many people here go to CES also, I know these guys do. One of the things that just strikes you as you walk through thousands and thousands of square feet of uh, technology space at the Consumer Electronics Show is everything is a screen. And, if, and almost all of them are filled with kind of 3D K-pop going on that, you know, that isn't relevant. And then occasionally you'll see one that's linked up and it'll be download Office Season 7. It'll be, you know, NCS. And that's where everyone's looking. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm incredibly passionate that content first and that content differentiates and that these players over time, when they do it right, will double down and triple down. And I think AMC recently in, in television, just using them, is, is an example of what could happen if House of Cards works for Netflix or if the channels blow up in a good way for YouTube or if Yahoo finds more success in its video-based uh, third-party content. You know, the, the People can't refute those statistics anymore. The humans are watching like four and a half hours of television per day. And the more these screens are connected and available, we're finding that the more people fill their time with, you know, no longer playing Sudoku as much on the bus, but they're watching, you know, reruns of The Office or their favorite movies on their iPad. And all of these companies that are aggregating big subscription bases, Netflix, Xbox, Comcast, they're all looking to use video as a leader in keeping those users happy and keeping them retained. So they're, you know, some are trying to license old library content. We license... 7% of our library to Netflix, a non-exclusive deal. Um, we're licensing things to Netflix abroad. We did a big license with, with Amazon as well. So people are licensing original content, whether it's House of Cards or library content or movies, to try and keep their consumers happy and to be able to show, hey, come to fill in the blank, and you will have access to all of your favorite content on all of your devices. And so this looks to be a trend that is going to be a long And do, uh, does Amazon emerge as a real player in the same way that uh, Netflix Amazon is a behemoth and yeah. should be considered a formidable player in every space they compete in that they enter. And Ben, do you do you spend time? I mean, economically, you're you know you're you're, you're building a company today. Do you believe that there's short-term revenue opportunities for you online, or is television still the sort of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Television is is still the big driver, and especially as it relates to global distribution. You know, one third, ten episode commitment from a, a big network to uh, your guys' point earlier was equal to the amount of investment across three channels. And, uh, and then the ability to roll that out globally and how that measures up is also um, consistent. But as we move forward, one thing that's also undeniable is the advertising rush to these digital platforms where they can do more with the consumer than just run a message. They can actually get two-way feedback, go deeper around content that the um, consumer wants that may be directly related to the brand's interest, sign up for the, for the showroom visit to go check out the car, go get the coupon off of having played the social game off of your piece of video to go into the store and get a discount. So that's another reason we're moving so aggressively into that space is that the primary funding source of the whole system is moving aggressively into that space. And we want to align ourselves with them early and hopefully grab real estate while it's still available. So in, in traditional television, a great producer comes up with a show idea, goes out and sells that show and gets a license fee, sometimes with a certain deficit. One of the frustrations we've seen in the marketplace at our agency is the amount of time it takes to connect with an advertiser. It just it draws out the process. And when you're running a company, that time you know, can cost a lot of money. Do you see that time compressing? You know, Jimmy, do you, do you see working with advertisers becoming more efficient online? Uh, or do you just think it requires more patience for content creators? So I, I know Ben feels this way as well. But we are, um, you know, we are actively in the field, I would say. Uh, you know, as an executive in this space, you don't have the luxury of being um, disattached from the advertising community. So, I mean, just this week, we had several Disney execs in New York meeting with a client, you know, pitching them business. It's not, you know, we don't look at it, at least, especially within Disney Interactive, we don't look at it as our interactive salespeople go into the field to, to work with clients. We're actually 
we're all kind of taking responsibility here to go meet with the clients. And I'd say to, to, to partner early is, is the key, to sit down with a client and understand exactly what they're trying to do, what their demographic is, who they're trying to reach, how they're trying to reach them, and, and bring them in early in the process and partner on an original idea, an original concept, whether it's a video series or a new product, um, to make them feel um, like they have some ownership, even though technically they may not, to make them feel like it is partially um, their product or their series. And so that, that has been, um, I think that's been pretty success, successful for, for our group to, to kind of proceed in that fashion. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't see that changing. And, and I know you, you took that approach even when you were in traditional television. Yeah, I, I just, at the end of the day, especially in broadcast pre-retrans, uh, you know, yeah. which the, they fund the system. Yeah. And the better uh, you can deliver for them and understand them I th from uh, the brands, I think one of the things that ha has been lost to your point about speed is there is a whole group of people in Hollywood who just think, oh, that's the new buyer, and let me go pitch them a not, show. Never an agency. Not you. We would not never you. be that not way. You. Never. Other, I met someone else in a different suit. But the, um, but the, uh, that, uh, that whole, the whole, um, you know, and that's, they, they don't have a system to respond to that. Yep. You know, and so, so there's going to be a whole series of translations between Madison Avenue and Hollywood that have to accelerate and continue and now plug in uh, Silicon Valley and Seattle, and in a weird way, because they're new to it, if you go to the can ad market, for example, in, in June, it is dominated by the digital players, and they are, they are taking care of every marketer there in a way that the traditional media guys have not invested in because it's been easy to every year make the sales, put up the shows, but the real difference is that the traditional media guys are still market making. They're actually writing a billion dollars worth of programming investment. You're probably doing three, you know, I don't know what the numbers are. Whereas these other guys are a little bit more backing into the brand to make the content versus just taking the risk. The great thing about the, the web, as we all know, is it's just, there's such low barriers to entry. And Silicon Valley is such a high beta environment that it influences people to go for it. And you can really try aggressive opportunities and they may go gangbusters and they may go broke and that's kind of the mentality of the valley. Um, to Ben's point though, there are still massive moats around the traditional media businesses and when you look at the CBS brand or the Disney brand and the balance sheets and the distribution we have, I mean and just the upfronts in May which write billions of dollars of advertising for each of the four networks, those are just long institutional um, practices that have been in place to help advertisers reach the content creators um, because they know they're going to reach tens of millions of people. I mean, our, some of our shows, the NCIS is having its best season. It's eighth season. It's, it's the number one show until Big Brother, is, you know, in its 13th year is reaching record audiences. And so these brands build over time, and that keeps advertisers more engaged. So I want to make sure we have time to, to take a couple questions. But real quickly, you're all, whether it's at Barry's office on the West Side Drive or in Bob's office in Burbank or Les's office in Studio City, you get asked a question, and I'm sure you get about 45 seconds to answer. So I'm going to do the same. I won't be as intimidating as your bosses. What do the next 10 years look like for your corporations? I think for us, it's just continued investment in storytelling. And the, you, you create great stories for advertisers to invest in. And the multi-platform slash international opportunities with retrans um, should translate into a long run of additional monetization. So these multi-platform uh, social media driven world is really good for good storytellers. Jimmy? Yeah, I would echo that. Um, an investment in storytelling. You can't just take Xander's answer. Creative, He's good. You've got to come Creative up with content. Yourself. Uh, you know, create great content, high quality content, and then in, in the interactive space, I'd say it's, it's mobile. I mean, it's almost insane today to even say the word mobile because it just seems like everything is mobile, right? You know, I look at my, my kids, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, they, they barely even know what a PC is. Like, it's all about the iPod touch, the, 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 iPhone, the smartphone, um, the tablet, and so everything that we're doing right now, every product that we're designing is, is being built off of what we're calling responsive design. So creating a, uh, creating a website experience that does not just work on, on the PC or the MacBook, but also works across devices, and, and the design actually responds. So this idea of you know, creating one product and shipping it many times across devices. Ben? Hits. It's easy. Hits. 
It's a great conversation. It's quick. I'll be like, okay, I'll be back to you once. Right. I got a hit. A bigger hit. How about this hit? Different kind of hit. You know, so that's, that's Diller, but he's a partner, not a boss. So right. I can go, e see you next week. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, are there, any, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. To the mic. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> Yeah, been there, done that. So, um, Benjamin, you talked about uh, your current brand and your, your three specific genres that, uh, that you go after. How and when do you see that those three genres might uh, grow and to incorporate others? Um, that's just our YouTube partnership. Okay. We're across all genres from action adventure, you know, dramas to sitcoms to reality to bilingual to, you know, so, so we're working across all genres that we connect to in a personal way or that somebody who's incredibly passionate and has a great idea conveys to us their understanding of that arena. We try not to go where we haven't been before. As a new father, I'm now thinking about kids' shows, but I never thought about them before. Right. You know, Lord help us all. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by Pampers. Um, but uh, actually, we're, yeah, I won't get into that. But um, so... Right now, it's all about what literally turns us on. You know, what, what are the ideas that you get passionate about and excited about? And then what are the steps that you can take that can make it happen? Because that's a big part of it, too. Right. So follow-up for that is um, what is the process for your, uh, your company for vetting material? Um, it is a legal process as well, unfortunately, due to, you know, there's probably 77 people who felt like they created the biggest loser. You know, from a woman on the street who ran into some executive sometime who's like, you should do something about weight loss. You know, um, so I think the first step is get an agent. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's, that's a recognized and Thanks clear route in. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks but it is. It, it's true. And, and then you can work with, with those agencies who are all sanctioned and franchised. You know, there, there is a real process to the creative mayhem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's a great route. And then an, another route is just to sign a form. All, all the big companies have, a, uh, have an engagement letter about, yeah. okay. uh, about giving away every right you ever thought you had, <laughs> including your left arm. And uh, I'm sure that was your last meeting with Jimmy. Exactly what it was. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? You guys were mentioning the different processes between Silicon Valley, Hollywood, Madison Avenue, how in some cases there aren't um, procedures set up. But I'm wondering if, in light of all the talk about advertising, you've had advertisers come to you and say, hey, why don't you guys develop a show about blah, 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 and we'll sponsor it. Like, is any of it coming from that direction? And if so, has anything been done really successfully? Or do you foresee more of that? Yeah, we, we've, we've had that several times at, at, within Disney Interactive. Um, and in, when I was at Yahoo, we had that as well. Um, and we've done it. We've actually um, launched several programs across both Yahoo and Disney Interactive um, that were brought to us by an advertiser. And I'd say some of them have been successful, some of them have not. But to, to Ben's point, it just boils down to quality and, 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 and figuring out you know, how, this, how a specific program could be a hit. I think what you, you just have to be careful in terms of not crossing the threshold in terms of um, brand and entertainment. It's funny, two years ago, that's all people were talking yeah. about is brand and entertainment. You hardly hear those two words put together anymore. Um, because I think advertisers today are actually moving away from brand and entertainment. And they're looking more at the possibility of, of taking their brand and associating it with high quality content, not necessarily having you know, this massive product placement or this massive product integration through every aspect of, 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 the, of the program. Um, so we continue to get pitched by, by advertisers regularly. In fact, the meeting that I referenced before in New York last week um, was exactly that. And we're, we're very open to it. But again, it's just going to boil down to quality and, and in my mind, not crossing that threshold to the point where um, it's basic, it basically is pure branded entertainment and it's not focused on, on what the guest, or what the online um, user actually wants. I don't know thank if you. you. Great. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Guys, thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, buddy. Thanks.
Jimmy.